Hello and welcome to the Finance Quarter, I'm Andrew Robertson. The normally staid world of accounting is racked by division at the moment over attempts to raise the ethical standards of financial planners. Now that may sound confusing, but many accountants double up as financial planners and now the Accounting Professional and Ethical Standards Board is trying to eradicate conflicted payments in a way that goes much further than the government's future of financial advice reforms. It's a new standard called APES 230 and a woman who helped draft it is accountant and financial planner Suzanne Haddon. Suzanne, what is APES 230 and what's it trying to achieve? Well, it's an accounting standard that's setting the um, guidelines to enable the public to get unconflicted professional financial planning advice. When you say unconflicted advice, what do you mean? The advice is given in the best interests of the clients and there's no conflict with how the financial planner is paid because they'll be only paid directly on a pure fee-for-service basis by the client. This means there's no commissions paid, there's no volume bonuses paid, there's no um, special conferences, free trips overseas. You get paid from one source and that's the client only. Well, what's the difference between APES 230 and the government's much publicised future of financial advice reforms? There's a couple of key differences. The first is um, the government's reforms um, ban asset-based fees. That's a percentage charged on how much you have to invest, uh, but only where someone's borrowed the money. And what happens in 230 is it bans the conflicted percentage-based asset fees for all advice. The next uh, difference is APS 230 is going to enable existing clients to ultimately receive unconflicted advice as well, whereas the government's reforms only apply to new clients. APES 230 has caused a lot of tension within the accounting and financial planning worlds. Why did you feel the need to go much further than the FOFA reforms? Well, I feel that the, the government needed to do the reforms because we hadn't. And as professional accountants, we need to operate under the highest professional ethical standards. Accountants have a professional reputation with the public and we need to make sure that in all areas of practising as an accountant, whether it's audit, whether it's financial planning, we operate in the best interests of the client and we're unconflicted in the work we do. Well, just on that term, best interest, there is a best interest test in the future of financial advice reforms. Why isn't that enough to ensure that accountants who are financial planners will actually operate in their clients' best interests? Well, I think there's a couple of points. Um, clearly, the government didn't think it was enough because they also made changes to how financial planners can be paid. Um, the best interest is there as a, as a guiding principle, but how someone is paid can very much affect the advice they give. For example, if I'm only paid if I sell you certain products and funds and investments and that's not in your best interests, the advice is conflicted. Whereas I may have been better to advise you than not buy that product, pay off your mortgage, reduce your um, home loan debt, buy a first home, put the money in term deposits. But if I've got a financial imperative to sell product, there's the conflict. Financial planners who earn their incomes from percentage of funds under management and other asset-based models are very critical of APES 230 because they believe moving to a fee-for-service model will decimate their businesses and their incomes. Your business is now fee-for-service. What's it done to your business? It's actually enabled us to serve more clients because it doesn't matter whether you have money to invest. I can give you uh, strategic financial planning advice in your best interest to meet your goals and not have to sell you anything and still be paid. So we actually have access to more clients, more members of the public who need advice. So what does a fee-for-service model look like? And in particular, I've had people say to me that they think their clients won't pay twice for insurance. So how does it work? The first thing is for fee-for-service, we use a range of elements when we're working out what fee for your services. But remember, how much you have to invest does not determine what services you need, so why should it determine your fee? So we look at the, in our practice, at the time involved in looking after you, but not time only. We look at how complex are your affairs, what level of expertise from the firm do you need for advice, and what level of responsibility with your affairs. But the important thing is it's not related to how much money you have to invest. 
In the case of insurance, you're not getting insurance for free now because commission is paid on the insurance and that's included in the premium. Well, lots to think about there. Suzanne Haddon, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Andrew. Well, as one of the authors of APES 230, Suzanne Haddon is obviously very much in favour of it. It's only fair, though, that we let you hear from the other side. For example, the Institute of Public Accountants says it won't accept APES 230 and will draft its own standard for its members if APES 230 is introduced. The imposition of APES 230 uh, would substantially increase the cost of advice and therefore potentially result in a number of Australians opting out of receiving advice and that is not in, a, in anyone's best interest um, and chief amongst those is of course the client's best interest. So, um, we believe that the, the, the proposal uh, to ensure uh, and enable an asset-based fee is still appropriate. It's, it's appropriate in other forms of investment, it's appropriate in other sectors of the financial services market uh, and we believe it should be appropriate in this as well. The other two accounting bodies, the Institute of Chartered Accountants as well as CPA Australia, are still trying to convince their members of the merits of APES 230. Paul Harding-Davis heads up accounting-based financial planning firm Premium Wealth Management, which has about $2 billion of client funds. He's also opposed to APES 230. He believes that even if clients are convinced of the value of advice, they won't pay for it, particularly in insurance. I certainly don't think that a great majority of Australians would be willing or able to, to pay it. Right now, those costs are... are deferred over five to seven years by life insurance companies who have deep capital and can in fact spread those costs um, over that time. I'd love for that to be right, but I actually don't think in that particular area people will. And I also think that uh, you, you'll have difficulties, you know, in that advisors can add a lot of value in handling claims and they do that now without needing to ask for any fees. <laughs> And now for something completely different. As I'm sure you're aware, much of the world of retail is in turmoil at the moment as our leading bricks and mortar shops try to fight off the threat of the internet and also cope with consumers who are more inclined to save rather than to spend. Peter Ryan is one of Australia's leading retail analysts and he believes shops aren't helping themselves by continually appealing to our rational side rather than to our emotions. I asked Peter Ryan for a rational explanation of what he means. Peter, you believe that retailers who make it rational for their customers are kissing their profit margins goodbye. Why do you think that? There are two reasons. Uh, firstly, I, th I think that in the mature Western world you could argue that most customers are shopping way, way, way beyond need. We're really into predominantly wants shopping. You, know, you could argue there's a couple of small things that we need to have, but most shopping is wants based. And secondarily, there are two parts of the process as far as a customer is concerned and two areas of the brain that are, that are used. One side is about emotion and it's subconscious. The other part is conscious and more rational. And when you engage the customer on the rational side of the brain, the emotional and the subconscious actually shuts down and you make them focus on very, very material, very rational things, price being the most rational of all. Of course, when you look around the Australian retail scene at the moment, all you see is signs saying that I'm cheaper than the next guy. Socially, everywhere in the world, customers are being driven towards things which are more human, uh, more intimate and are connecting with them on a human basis. You know, it's a very cold, technologically, transactionally driven world. And therefore the counterbalance to that as human beings psychologically is we seek intimacy and human connection. And the retailers that are doing really, really well around the world understand that. They keep things in a very euphoric, emotional, uh, subconscious level where it's about connecting to the customer and engaging with them. So what goes through a customer's mind when they're at that emotional level and shopping on their emotions? Uh, not a lot goes through the mind. Um, the brain is working, but you're more reacting to things. You know, part of the, the problem with contemporary life is, is that we've, we've disconnected a lot from instinct. You know, emotion and, and the subconscious elements of our brain are, are a lot to do with instinct. So shoppers in an environment can often go in there, have a fabulous experience, walk out and not be able to tell you why it was so fantastic, just so they had a great time and they can't wait to go back. So when they're in the rational mode, they're focusing on price and saving money and getting value for money and things like that. Is that the difference? When you're in a rational state, you're focusing on the things that you think are rational to justify a purchase. And generally speaking, the most rational of all is price. 
The problem with that though is that when you get somebody into a price fixation, what they will do is they will meticulously, aggressively hunt down the lowest price. So why do you think many retailers are focusing on the rational things at the moment and not the emotional things? Because like most areas of life today, we overthink things and we're, we're more comfortable dealing in the rational space. Um, men in particular are, are more comfortable dealing with rational uh, criteria. So even though you're arguing that men are more comfortable like that, what should shops be doing to keep men in the emotional space and protect their profit margins? You could argue in some instances they're easier to get into an emotional state. If you've, if you've seen a man in Bunnings, for example, on a Saturday morning spending hours you know, having fun in there as a giant workshop, or you've seen a man who's into golf in a golf store, they can while away the hours just dreaming about being Tiger Woods. So getting them into an emotional state isn't really a problem. It's, it, for most of it, it's the way we'd like to be. We just get pulled into rational by retail environments because they almost force us into that. Is it fair to say that one of the best companies at the moment that keeps its customers in an emotional state is Apple, and because it's so good at that, it can charge a hefty premium for its products? Two of the most outstanding retailers in the world at the moment are Louis Vuitton and Apple, and they both use a similar principle. They, they do make sure that their product isn't over-distributed, so there isn't too much pressure on the price of those products. They do handle the price to market incredibly well. Part of that also is that there's price integrity as far as the customer is concerned. So there's, no, there's never a feeling that I'm going to be ripped off by either Apple or Louis Vuitton. The price is the price. It's not going to be cheaper somewhere else. But what if you're a shop that sells the necessities of life, uh, things that people can't do without? How do you move your customers from rational to emotional? Even on things that we call the necessities of life, like food, there are masses of margin in food for food, uh, food groupies, if you like, people who are turned on by that who do see great value in getting just the right cheese from Umbria uh, or just the right salad to set off a particular meat dish. You know, people will spend and go the extra mile to get the thing that really turns them on. It's a, it's a, it's a bit about understanding which people get turned on by things and which people don't. Peter Ryan, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Well, that's it for what I hope has been an emotional experience for you watching the Finance Quarter. As always, if you'd like to see any part of the program again, you can find us on the ABC News website. Just go to the business page and click on the Finance Quarter icon. We're also on Twitter at the address on your screen now. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Finance Quarter.